The following program is made possible by Planet Earth Diversified, Melee Productions, and Leslie P. Jenkins Photography and Graphic Design, with additional support from Flavor Magazine, serving the Piedmont's local food and wine culture. Hi, I'm Michael Clark for Meet the Farmer TV. Here we are in mid-March. We're pruning our raspberries. Let's learn some more about raspberries and berry production in Virginia. Let's travel down to Virginia State University for the second annual Virginia Berry Growing and Marketing Conference. We'll find out what Razor Raffi and Chris Mullins have in store for us. We welcome you to the Virginia Berry Production and Marketing Conference. This is hosted by uh, two very talented specialists who really focus their work in berries and berry production, Dr. Razor Raffi and Mr. Chris Mullins. Um, I'd also like to recognize our dean, who's very supportive of all the work that we do, Dr. Alma Hobbs. Berries are what I often refer to as uh, the Earth's superfoods. Uh, they're credited for their value in the treatment of many diseases, uh, such as leukemia, breast cancer, heart disease, high blood pressure, gum disease, and macular degeneration. Some are even crediting berries for making us younger. That's the berry I'm really trying to get my hands on. <laughs> and every day the, the health benefits of berries are being discovered and backed by solid science. And you, like many others, are interested in berry production and have a need for education in such areas as market diversification, marketing strategies, consumer education, and legal issues in production and marketing. And I know that's why you're here today, and our agenda covers it all. We have presenters who have come from far and wide to be here today, experts from Virginia Tech, Rutgers University, North Carolina State, Ohio State, Pennsylvania State, and people are represented from the state of New Jersey. And I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Reza Rafi to come forth. He just has a few words he'd like to share. On the behalf of Virginia State and Organi Organizing Committee, I would like to thank all of you for being here. At the end of the day, at Virginia State and Virginia Tech as the institution, educational institution, we'd like to continue and create partnership with you because it's important to come and learn at the day of fruitful day like this. But at the end of the day, we have recognized that there is a tremendous, tremendous potential in the, on the East Coast and we would like to see as a part of our plan is to, in the next five years, 10 years, uh, flourishing of berry industry in Virginia. I think that, that you know, they are going to talk about the marketing and production aspects of it. But yet again, for us as institutions, it's important to be able to partnership with you, provide you with the, with the uh, technical assistance, and help you hopefully find your way, uh, niche way to, to the market. Dr. Pavlis, did you say blueberries were the most popular. Well, did I you? Still believe that. Yes, and I understand why he is a blueberry expert. Um, he and is a regular guy. And a regular guy. We're <laughs> glad to hear that, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Fabulous. He's joining us from uh, Rutgers University Cooperative Extension. His research has changed the way uh, commercial blueberries are fertilized. His introduction of trickle fertilization has resulted in higher yields and better blueberries for his growers. And he publishes a weekly newsletter called the Blueberry Bulletin. Uh, this newsletter gives up-to-date information on marketing, disease, and many other topics crucial to commercial growers. So we're, let's welcome, and we're happy to have, Dr. Gary Pavlis. Rappi called this growing blueberries challenges and opportunities, so I'll stick with that idea. Um, we, we're going to kind of really quick uh, go over what you see here, uh, a little bit about cost of establishment, of which is, of course, uh, one of the challenges. And I got to tell you, most of this is challenges, you know. Um, uh, opportunities as well, you know, but that's a whole other thing. Uh, site selection is a challenge. Um, soil test, we, we'll go into that a little bit, and varieties, irrigation, marketing, um, but this is some of the stuff that we're going to look at. Um, you might wonder why do you have to bring somebody down from New Jersey to talk about blueberries? Um, well, I brought a, a picture of a typical harvest in New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, if, if you do blueberries and, and it doesn't look like this, I guess you need to listen up. Okay. 
<laughs> because uh, this is the typical in Hamilton, New Jersey. This is what we use. So, uh, you know, obviously we must be doing something right, right? Okay. Um, so, uh, what does it take to get into it? Well, you know, these are perennial crops. Um, and uh, the most recent uh, idea uh, and, and data is that it's going to cost in the $8,500 range per acre to get into blueberries. Um, and, uh, you know, that always varies. I always see these kind of figures and, you know, one guy gets into it for 5,000, another guy said it cost him 12. But, um, but the reality is, is that uh, these are the numbers. Um, and, you know, I think if nothing else, uh, these are what I try to tell people that are getting into blueberries or uh, the other crop I work with is grapes, is that these are, a, this is a perennial crop. Um, you know, it's not tomatoes. Uh, if you want to do tomatoes and you mess it up somehow, um, well, the tomatoes don't do well and you can start again the next year, you know. Um, <laughs> blueberries are sort of like, I, I always say that blueberries are sort of like your kids. Um, anything you do wrong today, you will pay for tomorrow, <laughs> you know. And, uh, and that's the reality of this. So if you don't uh, cross every T and dot every I, it will come back and bite you in the butt, you know. So uh, that's the reality of it. So uh, these things have to be done right. It's a privilege to uh, introduce Dr. Alan Straw. He's with uh, Virginia Cooperative Extension and Virginia Tech, and his work focuses on uh, plastic culture strawberry production. Uh, I have a lot of respect for Dr. Straw because of his passion, and he's a compassionate person. He's really uh, excited about his work, and uh, he really enjoys working with people. So. Dr. Straw, I'm going to turn this over to you. Challenges and opportunities in strawberries. We have kind of gotten some people that are doing some hybrid systems now where we're doing matted row production, putting drip tape under the row and drip feeding them. And those varieties that we use in, in matted row production will take that to some degree. On the plastic culture scene, uh, of course, we usually do one crop. I've got more and more people, though, that are wanting to do two crops because of the cost of plants. I'm estimating now it's costing at least $3,000 an acre to buy plants. Dr. Ballington is joining us from the Department of Horticultural Science at North Carolina State University. Um, you heard Dr. Straw talking about extending uh, the, the bear production season through high tunnels. And uh, Dr. Rafi and Chris Mullins are focused on that here with raspberry production. Uh, Dr. Ballington has been very successful at growing strawberries in North Carolina in high tunnels during the winter season. Yeah, North Carolina does have a, especially North Carolina State University, has a long history of uh, improvement in production of small fruit crops. I was in Reedsville, just below, you know, just below Danville, a couple of summers ago during strawberry season, and they had a blueberry dessert. I said, oh, we'll try this. It was one of these blueberry crumb desserts. Well, I bit into it. And they, were, I can tell you, they were probably bright well from Georgia that had been frozen after not having any irrigation in the field and they had a dry summer. <laughs> and I said, if anyone, if this was the first time any one of these people that came in here had tasted a blueberry, they'll never taste another. And they see, these are the types of things we need to be aware of. And if you run into a, a problem with any of these, you can always go to the website smallfruits.org. We're going to move to our, our two fine ladies here. Uh, Ms. Kathy Demchek is an extension associate in the Department of Horticulture at Penn State University. Um, she focuses on strawberry plastic culture and high tunnel production of uh, brambles and strawberries. We also have Shirley Klein, formerly an extension agent with Cornell Cooperative Extension. She has an international background. She's an international consultant in Honduras, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Guatemala, Bolivia, Haiti, Moldova, and Mexico. Wow. <laughs> and she uh, has owned and operated Happy Valley Berry Farm. So, welcome. Um, high tunnels are basically low cost protective structures um, that, that look similar to a greenhouse, um, but there's less infrastructure to them, they're lower cost. Um, you can figure on the cost being figures I've heard are roughly about half of the greenhouse. Um, so, you know, you, you do have some cost savings there. One thing about them is typically they don't have a floor to them, so you can plant plants directly into the ground. This is something you know you really need to work out with your local um, tax, well, I guess, yeah, <laughs> with your local tax officials. Don't need a 
building permit and you don't get taxed on them so that's a nice thing yeah I have heard um, of some folks who have some problems convincing their local officials of that and so you may need to just touch bases with them beforehand to make sure that isn't an issue tunnels used worldwide for um, for berry crop production used for other things too um, but mostly when they're there um, they're, they're being used either for protection from rain um, or for season extension, um, depending on the location. In North America, um, within the bramble crops, are used for raspberries and blackberries. We'll concentrate mainly on raspberries today. Um, and again, for the same thing, for protection from the elements, rain, possibly sun, um, in, in California for some shading. And they can be multi-bay or a single bay. So you can extend the spring and fall growing season. Things grow earlier. Um, and then you can also harvest later with them. You do have that protection from rain um, with either single or multi-bay, and if you have a single bay tunnel, you also have protection from wind. So surely I think at this point. Um, as Kathy said, the high tunnels don't have any heat source. You ventilate by raising the sides and opening the ends of the tunnel. Um, <coughs> And this is a picture of one of my tunnels at home. This is actually a 14 foot wide by 96. The thing that we found in southern New Jersey, and I'm in plant zone seven, so we're pretty warm, um, is you have to have at least a six foot wide opening on the side here, okay? Uh, we started out with lower ones, and what we've done, we had three of them that were lower. And we went back and retrofitted them and have raised all of them to a six-foot opening now. Usually when I go in and, and prune, and I'm actually getting better with age. Can you believe that? I used to hate to cut them down because I kept thinking, I'm cutting off my, my harvest there, my yield. But I'm really getting better, so I'm getting them down here and down here now. And that's actually better. You get a higher yield, you get larger berries, and since a lot of my production is heritage, the larger berry you can get, the better off you are. Um, at the base, we have two by sixes, and then this, what some people might call a hip board, but I call a headboard because that's where it is, is a two by four. And we use all pressure treated lumber. Let me warn you that the only disadvantage to using pressure treated lumber is if you want to grow organically and you're growing your plants in the soil, you cannot be certified organic, even though you do everything else organically when you have pressure treated lumber. So if you want to grow organically and you want to be certified, get some of this new artificial lumber and put on the ground, okay? We plant, depending on the variety, 18 to 24 inches between plants and one of the things that you need to take into consideration there is how vigorous the variety is that you're planting and how much it spreads out. So like if you're planting Autumn Breton, you wanna keep those around the 18 inch because that, that variety doesn't seem to spread out very much. At least it, that's my experience on my farm. But if you get into something like Heritage or Josephine, well, then you can go 24 inches apart. We're going to go ahead. Uh, Dr. Fernandez has been so gracious to, to, to uh, do the presentation during lunch and change rooms and everything, so we appreciate that. And uh, we're going to go ahead and get started to keep, to keep up with the program so we can get you out of here on time tonight. You don't want to be leaving it at 8 or 9, do you? So, so let's, uh, let's go ahead. And I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Fernandez to talk about uh, the, her experiences uh, education research-wise with blackberries in, uh, in North Carolina. So you can actually go in your grocery store and you can see blackberries and raspberries and blueberries pretty much all year round. Not necessarily produced in Virginia or North Carolina, but you do see them year round. Um, there's interest in locally produced food. Is that important here in Virginia? Yeah, okay. So it's important in North Carolina as well. So um, not only is it being imported from abroad and consumed in you know, North Carolina and Virginia or wherever, um, but it's being produced locally too, and that's an exciting thing as well. So you're thinking about planting blackberries next year. I hope you're not thinking about planting this year, okay? Because you really need to prepare those fields, unless you've thought about that a year ahead of um, already. You need to prepare a year in advance. You need to get the ground ready. You need to get rid of all the weeds. You need to you know, set up your irrigation systems. 
So you need to be thinking about it right now if you're going to be doing it next year. And, and also if you want any sort of large number of plants, you're going to need to order them now for next year too. So there's lots of things going for you, if, um, against you if you want to try to get them in now. You need a site that has full sun, that has good air movement, and adequate soil moisture. And we recommend, highly recommend, um, that you have an irrigation system. You need a deep, well-drained, um, loamy soil, 2 to 3 percent organic matter. I've seen them planted on really high organic matter soils, and they really like them, so make sure that you have at least 2 to 3 percent. Um, pH 6.0, um, between 6.0 and 6.5 is good. Um, you can have them in sandy soils, but you need to have irrigation, and not so sandy soils, you need to have irrigation. Um, it's highly recommended. Thank you, Dr. Fernandez. We've got one more session up here. We're going to do a... Uh, a grower panel discussion, some presentations, then a discussion, hopefully, if we can move it along. Um, when Dr. Rafi started talking about this, um, I agreed with him that a grower panel is always good for people that are out there wanting to grow to listen to some su successful growers and find out what kind of things they've done uh, and maybe something that you can emulate. So let me ask uh, the four people we're going to have on the panel to come on up. We've got some chairs up here. You can sit down. Uh, Ms. Shirley Klein, Mr. Chuck Geyer, uh, Mr. Clyde Good, and uh, Mr. Tom Baker. Black raspberries uh, are indigenous to our area and are very adaptable, but if it gets very hot on them very quickly, they will get ripe all at one time, or if it's too hot, they'll turn into black raisins. <laughs> this is another, another shot of uh, a different age planting with it beginning to develop some fruit. You can see just to the side of it um, how we plant our new plantings. They're on raised beds black plastic mulch with a single trickle irrigation line underneath. We're using the same machinery we use to plant strawberries with. We grow our own plants. We, we purchase what's called a one-year-old rooted cutting. Uh, you can see those there. Uh, and we, we purchase ours from Fincher's Nursery in North Carolina. Uh, and we get those in March. In fact, we're getting some uh, shipment next week. Uh, and we mix those in 50-50 mixture of peat moss and sand and put them in a one-gallon mum pot. And we plant those right now, and by the time the fall rolls around, there'll be, it'll be a nice, well-developed plant with good root structure in the pot that uh, you can, we can set out in the fall. We do our planting in the fall rather than the spring. It, it just looks like the fall, we can get the land prepared up better in the fall. Once they get their roots established, they're ready to go in the spring. The springtime, it's hit and miss with moisture. A lot of times you'll get too much rain and it'll be difficult to work the soil up. And then if, you, if you're getting well into the season when you can't plant. So we like to plant in, in, in the fall. Um, our ne next speaker is uh, Tom Baker from Brookdale Farm. Um, he did make a presentation last, last week and he, he, last year. He had, uh, how many slides did he have last year? It was like 100 four slides, <laughs> it was, but he, he's a great speaker, that's the bottom line, he's a great speak, speaker and uh, we are grateful for you to be here and share your experience with us now. Thank you. My finger works very fast and I, you'll have to speed up your ears to keep up with my mouth, I guess. Uh, Alan Stahl said that he would uh, like to have some more strawberries most anywhere in Virginia except Pungo or Scott County. We have uh, three strawberry producers here from Pungo that I've seen today, maybe another one. Lewis Culliford's over here. He's one, he, his farm's one of two other strawberry farms within sight of my house. The dean of the strawberry producers in Virginia Beach is Winky Hanley. He's back here. And uh, Winky's forgotten more about strawberries than I'll ever know. So, and uh, Winky's also the one that helped us get started with our first crop. And Winky, I've never forgotten that. Appreciate it a lot. Um, Rookdale Farm is the name of our operation. and. Uh, Everybody wants to know about money, so what do we do? Where, do? where do we make our living? You pick strawberries is our first thing. School field trips is our second most important thing. Summer produce, followed by pick your own pumpkins. Uh, we sell a few uh, wholesale pumpkins if we have any left, hay, some lambs, and land that we don't have something else on, we have some soybeans. So uh, you pick is our main thing. We, uh, we pre-pick very few strawberries. Um, we can sell all that we pick, but we don't have the labor to pick very many. Urbanization, we're farming on the urban fringe and that's what makes it all work is right there with that big population base. Um, when we started out, this right here where this, uh, what is that, about $800,000 house probably, Winky? 
that we had a cornfield maze there in 1999, 2000, 2001 uh, on the farm that was then developed and that's one of the many houses like that on that farm. So that's what we're dealing with, a lot of neighbors like that. Here's one of our pumpkin fields and another house, you know, right beside it. Uh, solar electric fence controller there, if you can find it, let me know, I've lost it. <laughs> All right, we have a rule, it's the only rule we have is very important. If it's easy or you can do it from a tractor seat, there probably is not much money in it. <laughs> now, there's a corollary to that. If anybody remembers Charlie O'Dell, who's now retired from Virginia Extension, uh, Charlie used to grow strawberries and, and some cane berries, I think, uh, didn't you call them? And some of the other blueberries and so forth. Uh, Charlie doesn't grow strawberries anymore. And so the worst part of the thing about strawberries is strawberries is a bend over berry. Charlie's converted all to what he calls stand up berries. <laughs> all right, so you can't do strawberries or any of them from a tractor seat. And if you want the easiest of the berries, I'd suggest you do something other than strawberries because the back can't handle too much of it. So strawberries is our main thing. Strawberries are not easy. We use the annual production uh, plastic culture system. I don't know anything about matted row. People ask me about growing strawberries in their garden and I, I have no clue. I wouldn't know what to do. My grandmother used to grow them, but you know, I picked them at her place like 45, 50 years ago. I, if you have a lot of hard work, a lot of good work, good luck, some more hard work, and uh, Mother Nature works with you, and you work some more real hard, and you have a lot of customers, you can make more than a little bit of money. Without uh, too much further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Mike uh, Ellis from, well, let's see, isn't it supposed to be the Ohio State University? Ohio State. Just Ohio, okay, okay. Uh, so he is going to talk with you today about berry uh, disease management. There's one thing that's for sure about high tunnels, it's definitely going to change your uh, disease management program. As was mentioned earlier, water is what's critical for the development of almost all the diseases, and you overcome that with high tunnels. So, you know, when you think about organic production in this part of the country, it, I think it's a little more feasible when you're looking at doing uh, within high tunnels. First of all, I never talk to growers, I never talk to my growers or any of them without emphasizing the importance of an integrated disease management program. Too many people think, well, if I can't spray something on it, I can't control it. And nothing is further than the truth. Nothing, absolutely nothing. As a matter of fact, some diseases there's nothing to spray for. So if you don't control them with cultural practices, um, you're not going to control them at all. Uh, some of the most important uh, components of the integrated program are disease resistance. Well, I mean, what could be better? Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of resistance in a lot of the diseases uh, we have to work with, but where we have it, we need to use it. Uh, cultural practices, again, paramount. I've got a handout on cultural practices for strawberry diseases. Uh, it's in your handout thing and it just kind of goes over some of the ins and outs, but cultural practices are so, so important. Biological control with diseases, we really don't have a lot. Minimal fungicide use. I'm going to be talking primarily about fungicides up here. I wish I could give my growers a program where they didn't have to use fungicides. I'm really not worried about the food safety aspect. I'm worried more about the cost. If I didn't think they were safe, I wouldn't recommend them. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Hannah Borak, if mm -hmm. I pronounced that correctly. That's correct. She's a new faculty at North Carolina State University. I met her at last uh, November in Strawberry Conference. I was really impressed with, uh, as a young faculty, enthusiasm and the way she is developing her program uh, with insect, <laughs> uh, insect uh, management. Uh, so with that, I'll let Hannah uh, continue. Integrated pest management means to me in insect management and small fruits. And I use the three M's of IPM, this is my mantra, minimize, monitor, and manage. What that means is to minimize, you create an environment that's unfavorable to pest species. So you do those cultural control practices, you select the right varieties, you harvest in a timely fashion, you construct your planting in a way to minimize the amount of insects that are going to be there. Monitoring is twofold. First of all, you need to know what you have. You can't control something if you don't have a good ID of what it is. So you have to accurately ID what the <coughs> pest is. You can do that through the help of your county agents. You can use us specialists at the university systems in your various states. What you do when you then figure out what your organism is that you're dealing with is track its populations over time. You want to be out looking in your field before you have a pest problem. Because usually by the time you see insects or mites out there, it's too late to get really good control of them. So you want to have a plan in place before the season begins 
and all of my recommendations are based on a weekly scouting schedule. We have the field day or tour. For those of you who, have, who are interested, just take your own, own automobile and, and follow us. It's only five minutes to, to the farm. If you're interested, uh, Shirley is going to be with us to, uh, to mentor us a little bit about with, with her experience at practical standpoint. Thank you and ha have, a, have a safe trip home. Well, whether it is here or not is another question. I mean, in New England, they do do uh, greens over winter in unheated tunnels, okay? And sometimes they'll put a tunnel inside a tunnel. Uh, so they don't have to use any energy to heat the tunnel, okay? Or, or they'll do things like in a crop. But, but don't you, you need, have to be careful you need lighting from one though, region you? to the next Enough as lighting. to what is really profitable for you and what you're going to receive for your product. Uh, if you can sell lettuce or mescaline mix or something like that to food service that time of the year, it's a great way to mm -hmm. fill your tunnel up if you've got a tunnel. So you need to look at what you're doing to control the structural integrity of your high tunnel at the time that you get those shear fronts coming in just as a thunderstorm is moving in. You know how all this is? Well. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> whoosh! And that's what kills you. That's why you need the structural integrity that we were talking about. As far as pruning is concerned, I was talking about pruning. Um, these are the canes that came up last year. So these are his 2008 canes. And you see how this died, or it's, well, it's not completely dead, but it's really slowed down a lot. So, I did, here's one that is dead. Does anybody have a pair of pruning shears by any chance? <laughs> Does anybody have a sharp knife by chance? I, I, do. I, I think I have one in there. Oh, hey, Shirley, what variety is this, Phil? Yeah, it's, uh, I, this is, this, this one is Heritage. I mean, you have a handout in there actually talks about uh, as a oh, okay. so this one is uh, this one is Autumn Britain and the, 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 the next one is uh, Caroline. Okay. So when you're pruning your raspberries, if you can see this green tissue around here, you want once you start encountering that green tissue and you, and you prune before you ever get to this stage, you know you you want to prune even before you get to here but it's okay still to prune at this point in time once you encounter that green tissue stop pruning unless you're pruning for height but wait until they get to be about 18 inches tall because what happens is when they get to be 18 inches tall they kind of uh, they've already established that dominance you cut it off and that's the real reason why you want to wait until they get to be about 18 inches tall before you prune them out is because you want to maintain that vigor in your plants. Well, there we have another exciting conference from Virginia State University, the second annual Virginia Berry Growers and Marketing Conference. They have so many good conferences. Check out their website and see what, what's coming up that you might be interested in. And thank you for joining us for another episode of Meet the Farmer TV. Now I'm going to go plant some more berries. For additional information and extended versions of this program, visit our website, www.meetthefarmer.com. The preceding program was made possible by Planet Earth Diversified, Melee Productions, and Leslie P. Jenkins Photography and Graphic Design, with additional support from Flavor Magazine, serving the Piedmont's local food and wine culture.